Hello Internet. Well, don't I look fantastic today? This is a new series that I was going to do in January, but then there weren't that many new books out for January for me to talk about, so I'm doing it now. At the start of every month, I'm going to run down all of the books that are coming out that month that I'm excited about, that you should be excited about. Most of them, as is our brand, will be works in translation, world literature, books about travel, books about other cultures outside of the English language. Some of them won't be. They might just be books that I'm excited about. They might be queer books. They might be books by people of colour. There will be diversity. For February, we've got seven books that I want to talk about. Let's go. I'm trying to do this list in chronological order, and that means talking first about a book that I've actually already reviewed. You can go watch my video on that right now. The Communist Daughter was written by Aroa Marino Duran, and it was translated by Katie Whitmore. It's a Spanish language book in translation. It's set during the 20th century between the end of World War II and the fall of the Berlin Wall. It's set in East Germany, East Berlin, and it follows a family of Spanish refugees from the Spanish Civil War who've set up a home in the communist world that they thought that they were fighting for. The socialism that they were fighting for has become a fascist world, as so often happened in the 20th century, when socialism was co-opted by hungry oligarchs. This is a story of a young woman called Katia who falls in love with a man from West Berlin and eventually ends up leaving and making her way to West Berlin to live with him instead. And it's a book of politics, it's a family drama, it's a kind of romance, it's a lot of things. I've already reviewed it, as I said, so you can go watch my review, and the book is out on the 4th of February. Next up is a book that's out on the 11th of February. This is not a book in trans translation, but it is very much a book about translation, about language, about the relationships that we build between cultures, between countries, between languages, between people. It's a very ambitious book, and I am currently reading it. It's a pretty slender book, about 200 pages. It's written by, I think, one of the booksellers from Mr. B's Emporium of Reading Delights in Bath, which is one of my favourite independent bookshops. The author is Swedish. She spent most of her life speaking in Spanish and Swedish and is now writing in English. In her bio it says that she currently lives in English, which I thought was a really lovely way to explain language. The idea that she has lived a life in Spanish and Swedish and is now living a life in English. The fact that she's writing this book in her third language is obviously very impressive, and what I've read so far is wonderfully imaginative. It kind of bursts and blooms like flowers. The language is like a jungle of words. How we are translated tells the story of a Swedish migrant to the UK who currently lives in Edinburgh with her Scottish boyfriend of Brazilian descent. And the book explores race and language and the communication between cultures, traditions, languages, etc. in a very ambitious way. When it begins, the two of them are pretty much at each other's throats quite a lot. They are not getting on particularly well, they're frustrated. He's currently trying to become an NHS nurse, while also, at the point that I've read, he is disenfranchised with the UK. It's kind of implied that it's about Tories, that it's about Brexit, that it's about all the stuff we've been angry about for the last five to forever years. And the protagonist, the woman, she works at a museum, I think. She works at this museum in Edinburgh Castle where the people who work at this kind of installation in the museum are all from different countries and they play character roles based on their own culture, so she plays a Viking. I haven't got that far into it yet, so I don't want to describe things that might be wrong. But it's very much about her relationship with her colleagues, her relationship with her boyfriend. It's not a narrative-heavy book, it's kind of a book about ideas and language and moments sort of snapshots of life, and it's really, really heavy on the importance of language. She quite often describes the language that her boyfriend uses, maybe uh, the Scottish dialect, or his own personal idiolect and her idiolect, and words in Swedish that are quite difficult to translate into English. And the book puts little bits of Swedish all the way through it and remarks on the difference between the subtle meanings of a Swedish word and its English counterpart. So it's very much a book about communication more than anything anything else. How the two of them communicate through language, through their cultures, but also just in terms of love and relationships and how we show our affection to each other. So it's a book of really, really big ideas and themes. So far it's a very, very engaging book, but it isn't particularly narrative heavy, so it will not be for everyone. 
So far, I'm getting a huge kick out of it, and I think it's teaching me a lot about communication and how varied the idea of communication is. Physical, verbal, emotional, even political or cultural communication. Really big ideas so far being executed pretty, pretty well, and I'm excited to see where it goes. The third book that I want to talk about, I'm actually intensely excited about. I've also just started reading it, and I don't have a physical copy right now. It's supposed to be in the post, so I'm reading a digital copy they sent me on Kindle. It's a new translation of Monkey King slash Journey to the West. If you don't know, this is a classic piece of Chinese literature, written around 500 years ago, so kind of the, the Shakespeare of China, if you like. The writer was someone called Wu Cheng'en, and as far as I know, Wu Cheng'en is a pen name. And this is one of the four great Chinese novels. If you study any Chinese history, culture, literature, you'll know that there are four great Chinese novels, and Monkey King slash Journey to the West is probably the big one. It's the most famous one. If you've ever read or watched Dragon Ball or Dragon Ball Z, the original Dragon Ball story where Goku's a little kid, that was inspired by Journey to the West. That's why Goku has a monkey tail, and it pretty much follows the story of this novel. Journey to the West, Monkey King, it has two names. Uh, this version is being translated as Monkey King. If you look on the Amazon page, it has Journey to the West in brackets. They get changed up a little bit. Anyway, it's a classic, classic Chinese book. You could think of it as China's answer to Shakespeare or China's answer to Homer's Odyssey Iliad. It's a big, big deal. And if you've ever wanted to read it, if you've ever had an interest in reading this but you never got around to it, Julia Lovell has brought us a new translation. If you buy it physically, it's one of those beautiful penguin cloth-bound hardbacks, and it's also out on the 11th of February. Monkey King Journey to the West is an ambitious, folkloric journey. From what I've read so far, and this is my first time reading any translation of this book, it feels a lot like Norse mythology or Greek mythology. You know when you when you read Greek myths and Norse myths, they are just full of campy, strange, enigmatic, horny, dangerous, mad people. And this kind of has an element of that. The book begins with how the world came into being, and it really feels like the same kind of world origin story you read in Norse mythology, which is fantastically strange and wonderful and kind of stupid, and I love it. And this has that. It very much feels fairy tale, folkloric, it's strange. There are, from what I've read so far, discussions about Buddhism, and Taoism, but the book has a very, very jovial, sweet childishness, innocence and sweetness to it. I don't know if that changes as it goes on, I'm not very far into it, but I'm so excited to be reading it. And what's interesting about this particular translation, it is abridged. According to the translator's notes at the beginning, the book is actually like 1200 pages long. This version is about 400, 350, 400 pages long, so it's very, very abridged, and Julia Lovell discusses in her notes how she abridged it, how she shortened it, how she tightened everything up, what she had to omit. Really interesting stuff. I'm glad it was abridged, I'm glad that this is a version that is more accessible, that I can easily read. And from what I've read so far, it feels like a very, very accessible book. It's an absolute Chinese classic. Monkey King, Journey to the West, is one of those essential pieces of classic Chinese literature. The piece of classic Chinese literature. And I've never read it. I've lived in China. I love Chinese stuff. I read a lot of Chinese novels and translation. I've never read Monkey King slash Journey to the West. And now I can. Now you can. Books out 11th of Feb. So when I lived in China, I learned about the 56 subcultures, races, groups of people who live within within China and Chinese culture, and it was a fascinating journey of, of learning and discovery. And what we have here is a book that's out on the 12th of February, and it is called Distant Sunflower Fields. Distant Sunflower Fields, which is really hard to say out loud, this is the first time I've said it out loud, Distant Sunflower our fields is written by Li Juan, and it is a piece of, I think it's either narrative non-fiction or auto-fiction. I can't remember which, but Li Juan is a member of a group of people who are increasingly smaller in number. I don't want to say going extinct, but their lifestyle is being kind of deteriorated, I guess, by modern life and modern culture. She is a member of a group of nomadic people who live in Xinjiang. Xinjiang is a province in the northwest of China. The Gobi Desert is either in there or partially in there. It's the Gobi Steppes, and she and her group of people live there as traveling nomads. They live in huts and yurts, and this is a book 
about her life, her journey, either fictionalized or, as I said, narrative non-fiction. I can't remember which. I haven't started it yet. It's out on the 12th of February, and this is a look into a part of Chinese culture that we don't know much about, if anything. Last year, I read a book that was published by Honford Star. It was called Hunter School. It explored the lives of Taiwanese people, the native people of Taiwan, not Chinese Taiwanese people, but the native Taiwanese people. And it was a world, a group, a culture that I didn't know anything about. I've been to Taiwan. Taiwan is one of my favorite countries in the whole wide world. And I didn't realize that there were native people there, if that makes sense. And this was an eye-opening read. Hunter School is an amazing book. And this is, it feels like it's gonna be the Hunter School of mainland China. This is going to teach us about an entire group, an entire culture of Chinese people in Xinjiang, that I don't know anything about. A really, really exciting journey of nomadic life in northwestern China. When do you get to read something like this? One of my most anticipated books of February, and it's called Distant Sunflower Fields. Check it out. I recently wrote an article about upcoming Korean novels of 2021, spanning the entire year, and one of the most exciting books on there is a book published by a publisher I just mentioned, Honford Star, great friends of Books and Bao, wonderful people, fantastic publisher, doing wonderful stuff with mostly Korean literature, but also some Japanese, Taiwanese, as I said, Chinese, etc. This book, this amazing, exciting, upcoming book from Honford Star is called The Tower. The Tower is written by Bae Myung Hoon, and it is translated by Sung Ryu. It's a piece of Korean science fiction. I don't know if that sounds like a big deal to you, but it's a really big deal to me because I've read a lot of Korean novels in translation. Never once have I read any Korean sci-fi. Korean genre fiction in translation almost doesn't exist. So much of the Korean literature we get in translation is literary fiction. We don't get any fun genre fiction. I've never read a Korean fantasy novel, a Korean sci-fi novel, some Korean horror, murder mysteries, crime novels. There's quite a few Korean crime novels out there and, and some really good Korean horror. I've talked so much about Pyeong Young, my favorite Korean author. Her horror is like nothing else. But fantasy, science fiction? No. Well, well now we have The Tower, and The Tower tells the story of a single huge skyscraper in Korea. This skyscraper is an entire society, an entire country and culture unto itself. And the whole novel is set there in little bite-sized journeys into the lives of people who live in this giant tower. That's all I really know about it. I haven't got the book yet, I haven't read it yet, but I am very, very excited to get my hands on it. And when you get a copy of this beautiful, beautiful book, the cover is stunning, if you turn it around, you're going to see on the back is a quote from Pak Chanuk, who is, if you don't know, probably Korea's greatest and most famous director. He directed Old Boy, uh, the revenge trilogy that Old Boy is part of, and he directed The Handmaiden, which is one of my favorite films. And somehow, they got a quote from him on the back of the book, which makes it exciting enough without even reading it. Anyway, I don't know much else about The Tower, but you're gonna have to go read it. The Tower is out on the 15th. I don't know if I said that. The Tower is out on the 15th. Out on the 18th of Feb from Picador is this. This is pretty exciting, isn't it? This is a new Roberto Bolaño book. I have to make an apology right now to anyone who's gonna be offended by this or annoyed by this. I've never read Roberto Bolaño. I know I should have. I know I need to. I know. I know. I've never read anything by Roberto Bolaño. If you don't know who he is, was, he was a Chilean novelist of the 20th century. He was a really, really big deal. And he was, uh, he was, a, he was an angry socialist revolutionary, I think, from the research I did recently, I think that's right, which makes him my cup of tea. His works are absolutely beloved all around the world. And what we have here from Picador is three novellas of his that were recently found, dug up. I think they were like found in his house somewhere and have just, been published. They're called Cowboy Graves. Cowboy Graves is one of the three novellas in here. It's not a very long book, and you've just got three fascinating stories. One of them is about a socialist revolutionary, one of them is about a cowboy, and I can't remember what the third one's about. Sorry, I didn't script this video. If you love Roberto Bolaño, here's a new book of his. Also, the cover is beautiful. It must be an old painting. I'm not really sure where it comes from, but it's a gorgeous, gorgeous cover. Roberto Bolaño. It's good, isn't it? Oh, I'm not doing my job properly today. Natasha Wimmer translated this from Spanish. Didn't mention that, did I? I can't remark on the translation yet. I haven't read the book yet, but Natasha Wimmer. 
The last book I want to talk about for February 2021 is Self-Portrait in Green. This is the book that I actually know the least about. And it comes out towards the end of the month on the 25th of February. It's a French novel. It's written by Marie Ndiaye. I don't know if I'm saying that right and I apologize profusely for it. It seems like it's a book about identity, cultural identity, personal identity, the search for and discovery of identity, crafting out, carving out your own identity. That's what it seems to be about from what I've researched and from what the blurb has told me. It's a bit of journeying and a bit of strangeness and folklore. It seems like it's literary fiction tinged with supernatural strangeness. It seems like it might be a bit Max Porter-esque, and I love Max Porter. And I don't read enough French literature anymore, so this is pretty exciting. Uh, the translation is by Jordan Stump, who's not a translator that I'm, uh, I'm familiar with, so I don't know. Maybe I am. I don't think I am. Jordan Stump. Don't know. Anyway, exciting book. I don't know anything about it. I will probably do a review of it, and it's really tiny, so that's good a kind of palate cleanser for the end of the month. All right, I think that's all the books that we have for February 2021. If there are others, I will be tweeting and Instagramming about them and making a big fuss about them when they come my way. But there are seven books in translation, except for how we are translated. Is that ironic? Feels ironic. Seven books for you to be getting on with. Seven fantastic books coming out in February 2021. I hope you're excited. I am. Let me know what books in February you're reading. What of this list has grabbed your attention? And tell me books in translation in February that you're reading that I've missed out on completely. I try my best to be a champion of translated literature and I always miss things and I always kick myself. So please let me know if I've missed any. Tell other people in the comments, hey, this twat missed this book do that for me. And let me know what books you're reading in February that aren't translated. I just want more books. I always want more books. It's kind of my thing. All right, go read and subscribe for books.